What's up, everyone? It's 2 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, which means you're tuning in to Canvas Legalization News. I'm producer Lauren, and today we're going to be speaking with Lisa Buffo, founder and CEO of the Canvas Marketing Association. We're going to be talking to her about some Canvas trends, what to expect in 2020, and of course, Green Wednesday. But first, we do have to get into a little bit of Canvas Legalization News. So what's going on, Miggy and Tom? Hey, happy Green Wednesday, Lauren. Happy Green Wednesday. <laughs> I this like is the that. first I've heard of this Green Wednesday thing. Is this just uh, concocted to sell more of those decarbing machines that we discussed last week? Yes. It's a, it's, <laughs> no, it's a thing. I've heard it before. Well, I still want to buy those decarbing things. You can get them on Amazon for like 200 bucks. Dude, I mean, to make butter and all the other like at-home yeah. shit. And, yeah, and, and, you know, we, like I said before, my wife and I, we did use the uh, oven to decarb it that way. I mean, there's a whole point about the uniformity of the decarbonization. You know, de decarbonization, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that fucking 10 times. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> but uh, we did have some news. And so one of the things now that I help people with the applications is that I'll be able to watch uh, and see where applications are coming next and then see and compare and contrast and all that type of stuff. So Illinois actually answered some of its own application questions and then gave insight as to what the scoring is going to be. So, you know, you can find that on their uh, website and it's the second questions that were just released. And they actually kind of break down uh, scoring for community engagement, diversity plan, knowledge and experience, principal officers, labor employment plan, and even the environmental plan. So that was pretty big news. And then the second one is looks like, uh, you know, the next state to kind of go. West Virginia. Can you believe that? December 19th, West Virginia application season begins. No, that blows, blows my mind. That one, I saw you post the other day and you're getting involved in that one as well. Uh, the way that this works is you start ranking nationwide. And then after you start ranking nationwide, you might as well help the person. And most of the uh, cannabis consultants that out th are out there are actually lawyers or a great percentage of them. Yeah. And so then, you know, it's, it's a lot of business consulting that I already do because it's how do you structure and form and operate a cannabis dispensary. And, you know, some of it will go easier once IRC 280E is gone because it's no longer a controlled substance. But until then, and then, you know what sucks about West Virginia's uh, medical market? Uh, let me guess, is it like a limited registrations? Uh, the the conditions are fairly limited, but pain is in there, so it could be, and so is PTSD, mm. so it could be worse, but uh, take, take another guess. No social equity. No, there is no social equity, so that's not there, but then just think about the plant itself. What would you like to have? Oh, no. It's not yeah. a no flower state. No flower state. No flower what? state. Why do people do this? What is their thinking? How are these grownups in charge? Well, I don't understand. Like, why? Yeah. Why do you have a no flower state? It makes it makes zero sense. It's like, well, for some reason, when it's in its natural state, it loses its medical abilities. But if you take a rosin press and extract that stuff out of the buds and then put it into a gummy bear, suddenly, freaking magically, it becomes medical. That's so silly. Yeah. Uh, I think they will allow vapes, though. So like vape oil would be there. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Excluding dry leaf or plant form unless dry leaf or plant becomes acceptable under the rules adopted for the Bureau of Public Health. So please do, huh. if you are in West Virginia, yeah. lobby the Bureau of Public Health. And while you're at it, don't forget to go to um, uh, the USDA stuff and tell them what you think about those hemp rules. Those are crazy. No, it's just beyond the same. But also... Um Man, that's that, that just crazy. Just to think that they're getting involved here. Uh, but the no flower thing, just like in Arizona, right? It was no flower as well. Uh, and Florida. They, Florida was Florida. no flower for a while. And then Florida got flower. And so and I think Georgia is no, no flower. Uh, maybe Iowa. But I think Iowa is not only no flower. I think it's also like no THC. So basically you just. Oh, my God. Yeah. But that basically just means like, oh, okay, hemp. That's it. Yeah. That's all they're yeah. allowing. Marijuana yeah. light. Marijuana light. <laughs> Whereas uh, Robert Platshorn on, on Sunday uh, was kind of ripping it up. He's like, yeah, that CBD stuff's crap. You have to have the THC in it. That was pretty insightful. Man, you know, it was great to hear him talk about like, uh, you know, even before I actually talked to him, I have this image of the sailor type dude. I mean, he's more laid down and more of a. He's a Florida man. Yeah. <laughs> well, not fully Florida, man. Well, I mean, yeah, he, 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 was, a, he was a smuggler. He did boats yeah. and shit, you know, from uh, yeah. Columbia to Florida. Well, and a businessman, too. I mean, he had a vision and knew that he was getting involved in something that was not harming people. You know, mm -hmm. like it's like saying, all right, you know what? I'm going to go smuggle these illegal Care Bears. You know, they yeah, don't hurt nobody. Now, hey, uh, let's talk about that. So we have actually launched Cannabis Legalization News 
So did you start to get the write-up done for uh, the Platshorn one? Sunday Sesh with Robert Platshorn. So if you want to read about the write-up, go ahead and check out CannabisLegalizationNews.com. So after we have uh, our our podcast and whatnot, now it has a place to live on the interwebs. Well, and the plan, too, is to add more content just to be entertaining as well. You know, Of course, yeah. Content and websites take forever to start building and ranking. But, you know, yeah. uh, provided that you keep at it, you'll get there. And I, I think, you know, you and I... Uh, we kind of got a head start in all this, you know I mean? As far as you being a lawyer, I mean, mm-hmm. you, your background on the business side of things is definitely the step up that I think you offer, you know, being an advocate and, uh, uh, you know, the book that you wrote, you've been looking at this subject for years, man. Yeah. And then of course, you know, my, my side, I'm just a, the, the advocate guy who says, look, I'm a normal fucking human being who keeps a normal fucking job. My family's fucking crazy, but God damn it. Everybody's family's not? fucking crazy. I'm going to go see mine later on this weekend and we're all going to like have some beers and, yeah. uh, and then we're going to be like, this is fun. This is, right. this is family. This is great. You know, uh, who wants to hit a yoga class? Someone starts drinking a little too much. It starts getting old memories and stuff and oh, yeah. bridges. You Did know, you used to have glory days. <laughs> glory days yeah is that is that the old memories yeah. no god no i don't have anybody like that but i just know how family occasions work and can you imagine a cannabis family occasion would be a lot different than a uh an alcohol cannabis you know that's something we're going to be able to ask our guests is uh how her family vacations are because uh, oh. she says that she's out in Col- colorado but now she's visiting the fam in ohio so i'm assuming that the buds don't make it over as easily but ohio's got medical do they i, yeah. I didn't know they actually have uh, some unconstitutional um, uh, social equity in theirs, which was just straight up racial, and it was yeah. and so they it didn't work. But um, you know, okay. at least they tried. But you know, uh, um, no matter what, if you're a consumer, you can always find it in any state. I think uh, oh, sure. I've never had an issue finding anything. Uh, these I markets did. are just I mean, like, super- good stuff. I'm sure, like oh, if I yeah. lived in you know Mendo, I'd be like, oh no, I never have any problem finding anything amazing. But if I lived in, you know, uh, what's what's the opposite of Mendo, Idaho? Yeah, Oklahoma. I lived in yeah. Idaho. No, Oklahoma, oh you can find all whatever you want in Oklahoma. Yeah, you're right. Oklahoma is uh, uh, up to the modern times. Uh, Idaho, though, is scary for sure. Yep. Uh, when I, but when I used to travel as a tech, that was one of the things that I would go to a bar. I was like, you know what? If I can find alcohol in this establishment, I damn well could find someone willing to let me have some weed. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you should be. It should be. I mean, they've been going together for so long. Well, my theory proved pretty good for five states, so in three years, so you know, it, it's there. We, you know, that's the thing, right? With the whole networking uh, with our guests, right? Networking, business, branding. Right. Uh, the cannabis culture has always been a handshake and a secret, uh, uh, you know, key phrase. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, this uh, muggles, uh, reefers. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I need an eighth of pizza. Yeah. And that, that's something I wish I would have asked uh, Platt Shorn a little bit more last week was like, wait a second. You just said lid really quickly as you were explaining it. Explain this whole lid concept, you know? Well, I think isn't a lid an ounce. Uh, or yeah. Four ounces. I think a lid's about an ounce now, but where did the whole term lid come from? I think that's something that he could have probably educated us on. Next time we have somebody that's, uh, you know, highly experienced in the cannabis industry, we'll have them answer how much is a lid? Well, I, I can imagine he could answer so many questions. Uh, you need to really see that documentary on the uh, the Florida scene back then. That that uh, uh, the Godfather's of Ganja. Yeah, it, it was pretty intuitive. Hey, uh, did you see though? Uh, uh, freaking Bloomberg decided. Oh God! President. Yeah, Bloomberg's like, yeah, that's what everybody wants. Uh, you know, another billionaire that isn't necessarily all that captivating and doesn't think that cannabis is good. Right. I mean, you know his stance on cannabis, right? He thinks it's stupid. Yeah, he thinks it's the stupidest fucking thing. Uh, which, like Biden, did you see the Biden flip flop in a week? Well, Biden's a moron. Well, yeah, Biden doesn't know. I don't. I don't know. I mean, like Biden's seventy-seven. I haven't been seventy-seven yet, so I'm not sure how crazy that makes your your stuff. But uh, maybe when you just get to be that old, you start saying shit, especially if you haven't been smoking cannabis. Because interestingly yeah. enough. Robert Platshorn is the same age as Joe Biden, and he didn't have any gaffes, and he was able to recite, you know, what had happened to him over decades ago and, and history and stories. And that's after 30 years of sitting in prison. Sitting in prison when he couldn't be medicating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he already went through, like, the worst health conditions possible, and now he's living large as a cannabis uh, connoisseur, <laughs> you know? He's an activist, man. Yeah. 
And then, uh, so what you were saying about Green Friday, I mean, that's a thing. You never heard of it before, huh? Green Wednesday. Or Green Wednesday, shit. I've heard of Blackout Wednesday, and that's usually where people come back from wherever they live, and they go back to visit home, and then they meet up with their friends, and they get quite drunk on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. That I've heard of. Uh, of course, I have not lived in a legal state for uh, ah. ever, considering it's not January 1st yet. But um, no, I hadn't heard of Green Wednesday. Yeah, no, it's definitely a thing out here. I mean, the, the metrics for uh, consumers, definitely oh. a huge thing. So like everybody goes and stocks up on Wednesday because it's going to be closed. Damn right. All right. Or if you got that one shop that's open until like two or three who are having sales all day. I mean, it gets pretty uh, uh, waiting in lines and... Uh, uh, but Man, see, I really do need to go to the dispenser and get some herb, but you know, you're not selling it to me. Oh, shit. <laughs> that's all right. I'll make do. Yeah, well, that's, I'm stocking up as soon as I get off of work today. So Go to Kush 21. Good people. Oh, yeah. that That's definitely uh, in my uh, perspective. Area? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, what else we got going on? I think what we got going on is we should probably talk more about Green Wednesday, but then get uh, get our guest on here so that she can explain to us, you know, how do you go about marketing for that thing? Damn right. Yeah, absolutely. Lisa, what's going on? Hey, Lauren and Tom and Maggie. How's it going? Pretty good. good. Thanks for joining good. us, Lisa. Yeah, it's good to be here. Great. Can you tell us a little bit more about Green Wednesday and how that came about? Yeah, so um, I'm not exactly sure exactly how it came about, but my understanding is it is a holiday, just like a Cyber Friday or, or sorry, Cyber Monday and Black Friday, but specifically dedicated for the cannabis industry, where, um, as you know, Thanksgiving is a social holiday. You spend it with friends and family, and it's a way for the industry to give specials and get some attention um, around people who are stocking up for the long weekend. Um, so you could call it the Cyber Monday of Black Friday for cannabis. That's pretty awesome. Uh, and that's a, like just kind of a generic analytics, right? I mean, this is, I was thinking about talking to you today, of course, and, uh, uh, Cannabis analytics are really uh, consumption analytics, right? Like here comes Thanksgiving and a three day holiday. Americans want to stock up and, you know, get ready. Just like beer is going to be selling a lot, you know, yeah. alcohol. What else do you look at? Um, in terms of analytics for today? Yeah. Um, we kind of consider... Uh, it is a holiday where you're going to be with family. So it is an event that can be high stress for a lot of people and can also be highly social. Um, and I think cannabis is one of those things that people turn to when they're happy and they turn to when they're sad and they turn to as a social lubricant and that, you know, they turn to for all these different reasons and Thanksgiving kind of checks a lot, if not many of those buckets at once for people. Um, but it's also a time to celebrate and experience joy and community. Um, and cannabis is naturally a very community oriented product. Um, and so I think it's interesting to look at the buying patterns, but it seems like from what we're seeing, it just reflects you know, the trends of the year, what's currently going on, but a little bit more at scale because people are purchasing more. And uh, even if they're infrequent consumers, they're probably going before the holiday because they have they have the time and, and space to do it. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at that, but also just sort of talk to people about what how they're consuming over the holiday with family and and why. Um, I know for us, it's Thanksgiving is a really exciting, fun time to be together. And um, I've been working in the cannabis industry five years now. So my family is open and accepting and now like very excited to partake and, and have some time together to do that. Where when I was growing up, um, you know, legalization wasn't a thing when I was grow right. growing up. And it, it feels like a, a fun step and fun thing to do. That's pretty awesome. So like then, uh, are you able to export your Colorado into Ohio and continue to spread the message of, this is great, this is just fine? You cannot cross state lines with cannabis, um, unfortunately. Well, you can. It's just a federal crime. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so given that information, no. Um, but but if just from like, you know, your own personal experience, you can be like, oh, you got to see this. You know, you could tell stories. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, and usually uh, people come to me in Colorado. 
Um, most of the time, once I moved out there, most of my family's in the Midwest in Cleveland is they usually come visit me um, out in Denver and we will do a whole thing and stop at the dispensary and check out the products and talk to the bud tenders and then pick a, a Colorado activity, whether it's just eating and drinking normally or going to the mountains or doing something out there. How long were you doing this before you uh, were able to come out of the closet to your family? Um, really not. Well, really not that long. I mean, I was a consumer as a teenager and in college when it was, you know, just being a teenager and in college. And I went to school at University of Maryland. So I was on the East Coast before legalization was a thing. Yeah. Um, and so we just didn't really talk about it. But it was more for me in my own time and recreation. Wow. Went to Colorado and joined the cannabis industry. Then it became a part of, you know, family rituals or visits and vacations when people would come to see us. Um, and at that point, once it was legal, it was just everyone was more or less pretty excited. So you're like so the family Michigan? bug. So like, I'm not Michigan. Where's Ohio then? Because I know that you guys do have operators. You do have medical. Uh, how's the state coming relative to Colorado? Because I mean, I'm in Illinois and I'm totally stoked for another month. It'll be you know, be a happy new year, right? Yeah. So it's super exciting, particularly for the Midwest, which is tends to be uh, slower to adopt yeah. progressive policies. Right. Um, and Ohio, so Ohio's population is around 12 million people wow. and Colorado's is five. Mm -hmm. um, and Colorado has an abundance of licenses. There's over 500 retail licenses in the state uh, for both medical and adult use. And Ohio, Ohio doesn't have an adult use program yet. They've really just sort of rolled out and gotten grounded in their medical. And it's still quite restrictive in terms of the number of licenses they've given out given that the population is significantly larger than Colorado, which, you know, some could argue is the most mature market in the country um, in terms of their regulatory structure. And they were just first. So they they've had a little bit more time to figure this out, um, but they're making progress and they, you know, got medical and implemented a system before um, any level of national legalization. So. Yep. I get, right. but we'll see. It, it takes time for these things to roll out. Sure. I like to say they went first. There was like a two tie thing going on there with Colorado and Washington. Um, yeah, you guys are true. just you're true. conveniently <laughs> overlooking California. That is Washington always gets neglected, though. I'm just saying. So, yeah, with the MJ Biz Daily article. Yeah, that what about this MJ at? Biz Daily? Thanksgiving week, cannabis sales boost green, green Wednesday and Black Friday. So, a 63% increase over the industry average. And the average Wednesday is 10 million. Well, almost 11, but the green wednesday is almost 18 million so lisa is this kind of the the data that you collect with uh, that like the mj biz article um we don't collect it necessarily at cannabis marketing association um we are focused more on producing content around education and best practices but we do like collect and utilize statistics like from mj biz daily um as well and use their information and in, in what we do because in that article they talk about 420 being the highest day but I was to say like Mother's Day. I mean, that's just the the, the, the smokers holiday, but there's got to be a what's the next one I'm curious about, too. You know, like what would be the next highest sales day after yeah. 420? That's a good question. I think um, Green Wednesday could be a contender uh, because mm. Thanksgiving is, you know, not religious. So everyone, for the most part, that's in America celebrates it and has Thursday off. Um, so I would be curious to see how, you know, you know, green new, um, you know, maybe the week around Christmas or or New Year's or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I haven't seen that data. Fascinating. So then what does Cannabis Marketing Association offer its clients? Yeah, so uh, we're a membership based organization. So we have individuals and businesses who are members of CMA. Um, and like I said, we're focused on education and best practices for industry marketers. So our whole mission is around positively rebranding cannabis and its consumers. But we really believe that the way to do that is to take a step back and empower those working in marketing and communications who speak directly and put on put out communications that um, specifically talk to patients and consumers. Um, so there's a few different reasons that we do this. One is that cannabis marketing is 
quite a disjointed landscape where the regulations, like with everything else in the industry, varies state to state and even at the city and county level. Um, and that can be quite confusing for marketers to figure out who are more maybe creative or analytically oriented than regulatory. Um, and so what we do is we produce monthly webinars and then we have meetings in nine different cities in the US um, quarterly where we talk about uh, education and best practices. So we'll do speaker presentations, we'll do panel discussions, and we'll talk about something at high level as social media marketing for the cannabis industry and something as specific as digital marketing for infused products manufacturers. Social media marketing for the cannabis industry can be kind of tough. I mean, Miggy and I have yeah. been, you know, promoting at least funny cannabis memes on Facebook and then our other content that we create on social media for about 10 years. And there's like a shadow ban. So you're not allowed to buy ads. You really can't use traditional uh you know, you can't use the social media marketing in the traditional sense that you could boost a post or buy an ad. What type of strategies do you recommend for your clients? So it is very difficult to market on social, which is truly unfortunate for this space because it, it's not an issue of compliance. Um, one thing that's super important when marketing cannabis is that the audience is 70% over the age of 21 for adult use products and 70% over the age of 18 for medical use products. So even though you could age gate and target an ad to adults in Colorado, Facebook and Instagram still don't allow it. So it's really just a matter of their terms of service and their policies that are not friendly to the industry. Um, I, how I like to talk about cannabis marketing is I refer to it as pre-internet kind of early nineties guerrilla marketing, where you really have to focus on your story and how to tell your story because your channels are so limited. Um, and channels are really just a way to to tell, um, of which there's far less channels that the cannabis industry can use than other industries. But it still doesn't mean that you can't focus on the basics and the foundation of marketing, which is who, who are you? Why are you doing this? What makes you different from any competitors? Um, and why should I buy your product? And if you can communicate that and tell that story, um, I think that's really important. And I I think something we see with marketers kind of industry agnostic today is they're so focused on the channel, like, oh, we've seen this much growth, growth on Instagram, or we've seen, you know, right. so much ROI on this Google ads campaign. But do you know, and have you taken the time to really understand who your customer is and who you're targeting? And if that messaging is resonating with them. So I think with the cannabis industry, um, it's highly, highly competitive. There are so many SKUs in a dispensary. I've heard- Wow, how that many SKUs are in your average Colorado? Because the amount of SKUs right now in, in Illinois is quite, quite limited, but as all these new uh, growers come online over the qu next few years, there could be a whole bunch. So I saw some data from Headset recently um, that there's on average about 5,000 SKUs in the dispensary, which I believe is a little bit more than even your average grocery store, but it's for one category, um, cannabis. It's not like a grocery store where you got dairy and produce and whatnot. It's for various cannabis products, um, which means it's highly competitive and it, well, you know, when you walk into a dispensary, it's not like you can pick up and touch the products or even read the packaging. Or Every, even have you, smell jars. You're not even allowed smell jars right. out here. Damn. Yeah. Well, can in Colorado. I know you can't in Washington, but in Colorado, they do let you, which is another, you know, one of those nuances on the state by state differences. Um, but yeah, you can't look at the pack packaging. Sometimes you can't smell it. So um, you're really limited in how you engage with the product before you get to the point of sale, um, which means cannabis marketers have to be creative. But again, reinforcing why I think storytelling and brand building is so important, um, yeah. period, but particularly in cannabis. Oh, yeah, especially in cannabis. I think, uh, as I was saying earlier, how it, the culture is like a handshake and secret code words and what you're offering, uh, all these networking uh, agencies, I think, offer is something valuable to the cannabis person because uh, how else are you going to know about a brand? Uh, how are you, you going to know about the flavor, the taste? You know, here in Washington, when it was medical, I would go to a, a farmer's market 
I could sample right there at the spot and smoke some like a little flower. He oh, talks me. about this farmer's yeah. market stuff, yeah. and it <laughs> makes me feel like liberty I, shit. you know, the, the back in my day, in good shit. old days. And I'm just like, man, that sounds awesome. No, ours is more like going to prison. But see, like now, the most sad yeah. store you've ever been into, like you remember the soup Nazi on Seinfeld? That's a lot <laughs> like buying cannabis in Illinois. <laughs> like you know, you have to follow a very specific procedure and no. No returns, no no questions. Get yeah. out, you know? Well, that's recreational now. But, you know, and then I see, Lisa, that you're out here in Seattle. You just started uh, to launch uh, your network out here. And I think it's going to do well because the big thing out here I've seen is one events. You know, you got to have people who are the, the influencers, the bud tenders. I'm sure that's a big focus for you is bud tenders. Uh, you know, you got to invite them to a place and say, hey, you know what? Try this joint. And, and then, you know, hopefully you got good shit. It's going to carry on. But... The other thing I've seen too is uh, like Willie's Reserve. Then you have like the national branding where it's like, if you're going to associate your name, you better make sure you pick a really good farm, right? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. but the networking alone is part of what you offer. Yes. Yeah, so events are a great way to connect um, with your consumers. So for us, we're more on the B2B side because our customer is – a professional marketer in the industry. So we work with businesses directly and help them, um, you know, understand the what's going on, where they are with the cannabis marketing regulations and really see that oftentimes their experience um, is not unique in the sense that cannabis marketers are all facing the same struggles, sort of regardless of what brand you're at or what sector of the industry to some degree. Um, so we help provide that community on the industry side of things. But I think for brands who are consumer facing and who have cannabis products, it is really important to do those in-person events um, and start to connect with people that way, because cannabis is one of those things where um, it is is I was saying very community oriented, but it's also just a part of your identity, right? Like I am a cannabis consumer, but I'm also a snowboarder and I'm also a friend and I'm also a female and I like to go to concerts. So I like when I see cannabis brands kind of target me at those things, like at a concert or, you know, up in the mountains and they're sort of approaching you from the place of this isn't just a cannabis specific event or a cannabis specific um interaction it's it's around these other aspects yeah, of your totally. life like part of your hobbies or whatever is geared towards that i mean that branding is definitely a good uh branding um I, like wham oil out here you had the pictures of the guy with the vape pen and the, the mountains taking the hike you know and and but then again like you're saying about the story though then people want to know well what's behind it because you know especially here in the right. northwest you know we're very uh, is that chicken raising a farm and did it live a good life? And, you know, oh, yeah, that chicken friend? was asking to die. It's like, please, yeah. I, the only thing I want to do is be a delicious uh, chicken sandwich. Come on. Yeah. You know, most, you know, most people don't want to see how the, 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 the milk is made or the, you right. know, the, the meat's made, but uh, in a cannabis industry, that's important for the consumer to know how your cannabis is made and where it came from, what intention, you know? Yes. Yeah. And cannabis as it's um, in terms of pesticide regulations, it's it's treated like food, um, but it is something that you put in your body, whether you're consuming it, um, whether you're using a tonic, vaporizing it. I mean, it is a, a consumable that goes into your body. And I think um, it is important just personally to be aware of what you're putting in your body, um, but particularly when it might involve smoke or it might involve um you know, like we're, we're concerned about organic vegetables because we don't want to inhale or eat pesticides. Cannabis is the same difference. Yeah. I don't I don't want to inhale pesticides or put chemicals in my body unnecessarily. And I'm personally willing to pay a little bit more um, for higher quality products that are, are going inside. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is important to do that and to be able to convey that in your messaging, if that's the type of brand that you are. And that's, you know, where you put your time and effort in your in your company. Cool. Hey, so like you mentioned earlier about when you're in Colorado snowboarding and there might be a cannabis company that's marketing right there on the mountain. I'm not saying they're handing out joints, but in my imagination, they are. Uh, so that sounds really, really fun. But, you know, in my state, in Illinois, I remember reading the law and there was like certain restrictions about where and where you can and cannot advertise so, like, how do marketing regulations vary by the state and which ones are stricter than others? 
So it just sort of depends on the state's appetite and culture for legalization. Um, so for example, in um, Massachusetts, you can't have branded swag. So you can't make t-shirts, lighters, there's things that would be branded swag with your dispensary or cannabis brand on it, um, which from a business perspective is like people do that because it's intellectual property. It's spreading your brand. Like it can be very helpful to do that. It creates a lifestyle. It creates a, a culture around it. Um, so I have branded swag myself. So I couldn't like I couldn't put my uh, my law for my, the YouTube channel and cannabis industry lawyer on a on a doob tube if I was practicing in Boston. Well, if you're a licensed cannabis company, so the restrictions and the regulations really are towards those who, what we call touch the plant, grow, sell, produce, or package it. Um, yourself and myself are ancillary service providers. So while we need to be conscious and aware of those regulations, um, we are not selling cannabis directly. So most of those rules apply to um, licensed brands. And then there are some states, uh, I believe Massachusetts is one of them, where they even restrict things like having a green cross or a green leaf in the logo wow. because they don't want that level of um, they've just decided they don't want that. They, that's not the brand that they want to put out there. So for businesses, say you have, um, you know, your dispensary in Colorado and you have a green cross or green leaf in your logo, and then you want to expand to one of these states that has a rule like that, you know, that's a, something to really consider when it comes to maintaining your brand and that consistency. Um, so it can, it can cause problems for marketers that way as well. Have you seen with the ancillary part of it, any uh, state that you're involved in, are they affected by the rules for the cannabis industry? You know, uh, like I know for media uh, here in uh, Washington, one of the, my favorite farmers, Mad Mark, I love his branding because he uses a Mr. Yuck for his uh, uh, thing. And I thought that was just like point on when I, when this becomes national, a Mr. Yuck is a, a cannabis brand saying not good for kids, but good for adults. I think it's gonna be brilliant, but um, he got fined for not putting a disclaimer big enough on an ad in a page of a canvas magazine, you know, saying, you know, for 21 and over. Uh, but do you see like the magazines themselves or anybody else involved with auxiliary uh, having be enforced rules that are kind of outlandish? Um, yes. And I think we've also seen some gray area that neither the industry nor the regulators really knows how to handle yet and is figuring it out as we go. And that is one of those things as a startup industry is that this is new on both sides of the coin for both government and businesses. Um, I know one that is being talked about a lot is like tech companies like Weed Maps who advertise they take advertising dollars from the industry and then display ads and menus to consumers who are using it Yelp style to find the products that they want. So they kind of fall into this area where they are not a licensed brand and that they don't have to go through the state because they're not buying or producing cannabis, but they are directly talking to consumers on behalf of these brands. Um, so I think for the ancillary companies, you know, it, it depends on where you are in, in your industry vertical and where you are in terms of the state. But I always think it's best to play play nice or play uh, on the side of caution because it, it it's a developing conversation between everybody. But the way the rules are geared and sort of the, the core values behind it is making sure it's appropriate for um, age appropriate. Uh, regardless of, of who it is you're advertising for. So I can see why the state would be upset about something that is might be um, not clear to children, even if it's not for a licensed brand, because that, that's one of those areas they don't really, um, you know, they're, they're quite serious about. Yeah, still all brand new stuff that we're touching base on here. Um, and I think, again, your, the networking portion of your, uh, your company, I think is going to be the hugest and most effective part, especially as each state has different rules. You know, uh, you got to get a group of people together. They got to have a common, you know, Dang. effort and no common knowledge, right? Totally. And that's actually how we started. So I was the chief mar marketing officer for a brand in Colorado back in 2015, 2016. Um, it was a wholesale brand. How's that brand and doing now? Um, they're not around anymore. I want, um, I just, I this is just learning for everybody. Remember everybody, the cannabis <laughs> industry is emerging, it's nascent, and there's a lot of turnover. And so remember, you know, most businesses do fail. 
Yes. Um, and I went through one of those examples mm -hmm. and it was, so I was the chief marketing officer for this brand and I went in to, you know, go in and do my job and realize like what I know about marketing doesn't apply here. Like my more traditional marketing background is, is not a reliable foundation for how to operate in this space. So I started asking other marketers, my colleagues and peers at the time at more established brands and who had been doing it longer, if they could um, meet after work in the evening one day and put on a speaker presentation or a PowerPoint about you know, this campaign that they pulled off or what they did when their Instagram account got shut down or what this regulation actually means in practice and not just in legal, you know, jargon, and then invited other marketers from other brands and companies in the space to come listen. Um, so it was very grassroots and honestly to help me learn because at that point, best practices and still to this day, best practices is who's really doing it effectively um, within the boundaries of what they can do. And yeah. We're learning it all as we go. And we had 80 people at that first meeting. So we said, okay, we're gonna do it again next month. We'll we'll charge $10 this time. We'll bring food and drinks and up the production level. Um, and that and we kept doing it. And that was how we started. You picked a, a really good partner out here for Halo Labs. Um, I, I just, I'm more of the uh, guy that just sits on the sidelines and watches everybody. And then, you know, I had the ones I don't like and I have the ones I like and Halo Labs is by far uh, they've done a lot of good things in the community and for the culture, and also they have really good product. Period. What products do they have? Yeah, that are so they good. Are. They do uh, uh, they are. cartridges. They do carts. All right. And uh, they, yeah, she. Okay. I I was introduced to her through some local uh, Washington cannabis people, but she's actually a young female entrepreneur from Cleveland as well. Oh, wow. um, and I got to see their facility in Washington, and it was it you was. You guys are great. exporting young female entrepreneurs in Cleveland. I know. Oh, I know the West is is a good place to be for entrepreneurship, um, and there's no legal cannabis like fully in the Midwest. So there well, is uh, in about a month, right? Yeah. And then I hear later than I wanted to start. That's something we should have covered in the news portion. Is <laughs> I think uh, December first, legal sales begin in Michigan. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. they do. How so, do you have any uh, clients that you're helping market there? Um, so, so we don't actually help clients market, but we help their marketers have a community to work yeah. with them. Um, and we do to some degree in the sense that we do education around marketing, but we don't, we don't put out campaigns on their behalf. Um, but we do have members from Michigan and the Detroit area specifically, um, who work with, you know, cannabis brands up there. And there is a total appetite for, I mean, it is everywhere, but being from here and seeing it as well, I think the Midwest is really ready and, and able and it's great timing mm -hmm. to accept um, a rollout of the new market. And it's a really populous area of the country yeah. too. Um, so I'm excited to see what, what happens with Michigan and how it, you know, kind of pans out compared to other states. But I think, um, I think it'll be fun. Michigan's got an old culture behind itself. So, I mean, really what they're about to do is just open the doors to everybody else and say, Hey, we're here. But, you know, like you're saying about the Midwest, though, I was in Oklahoma right before they did medical. And what I saw was CBD stores, actual just CBD stores that were as much as 7-Elevens all around. You know, you they had pot leaves and green crosses. And uh, it's, it's like they were ready for medical to happen right away. They were they were not they were already informed about the plant. And, and so it's amazing to see like where you're at, where you're living at in Cleveland, like eventually it's going to happen. Yes. Yes. Um, and it is that way here in Ohio too. And I, I live in Denver. I'm visiting Cleveland just for Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, yeah. Where my, but I grew up here and so my family's here. Um, but I've actually seen it here too. Like we were just driving around and doing last minute shopping before this interview. And I saw the CBD stores, like retail stores in Cleveland, which is not by any means a retail hub um, or <laughs> even have like a thriving pedestrian retail environment. Um, but it does seem like at this stage in 2020 and with the more act past federal prohibition being really here and in front of our face that there is um, a, a solid feeling that change is here to stay. And it's just a matter of when and not if, and it's yeah. sort of get on board or you're going to miss the ship. Yeah. Seriously. I, I mean, with the, the media networking angle too, uh, here in Washington, uh, dope, just closed doors in Seattle. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, High Times is evolving into 
something different now that we all know, but you're limited into your, your networks now, like your magazines and your, you know, obviously social media is an issue. Uh, what do you, what do you think uh, people have done right and wrong with their marketing so far? Um, I think one thing some companies have done right is really focused on their differentiator. Um, so I don't think really with any products, you want to be everything to everybody. But and I think in cannabis, that's really important as well. So what makes you different? Um, I've seen companies that specifically target baby boomers and older, and they're targeting more of that aging population who might be having um, pain or chronic fatigue or things like that, um, and really focusing and owning that that is their differentiator and that is their target. Um, I've also seen brands who focus on things like sustainability, and that is their differentiator. And they talk about sustainability at every touch point with the customer, whether it's how their cannabis is sustainably grown and or how the packaging that I'm receiving it in is recyclable and, and whatnot. Um, so I think those that focus on what makes them different and also are able to translate that into who is my target customer, they're doing their marketing homework um, and really taking things that step back at that brand level and understanding who are we as a brand and who are we as a company. And I think that not only resonates with consumers, but also internally with your team and your employees. And if you want to have an effective and efficient company, your team and your your employees need to know who you are and what you stand for and be empowered to make decisions in alignment with that. And that makes the company better. Um, all, all around. And so I think those that really have taken the time to think about their their brand and who they are and why they're doing it um, are, are doing the, their homework that's going to pay off. That's pretty neat. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so then I would get, get into like, well, and how does a, a brand differentiate itself from the various sides of the flower? I mean, do you see different branding and marketing that you would do for a dispensary as opposed to a cultivator? Yes. And I think it's there are two totally. So a dispensary is a physical retail um, product and cannabis is one of the few things you can't really buy online. I mean, I don't, there's very few things I actually go to a physical store for these days anymore at all. Um, I mean, even groceries you can get delivered. It's crazy. And so, but when it comes to cannabis for me, I'm like, where's the closest dispensary to where I am yeah. at any given time? Um, you know, when I'm home for significant periods of time and have the luxury to maybe drive a little further and think about where I want to go, I will. But for the most part, I'm looking for what's close. And then once I get in the store, you know, I'll shop for products specifically. So I think for retailers, um, community building is important because you're selling to people who live close and who are going to walk with their feet into your store. Um, and they don't have another choice of how to get their cannabis. Um, California and some states do have delivery, but for the most part, um, you know, you're going into the store to buy your cannabis products and new consumers are going into the store to buy their cannabis products. Um, so yeah, so I think with a retailer, things like community building and really understanding where their physical store is amongst the demographics around them is super important. And then a cultivator, you know, they sell to the retailers. So their target customer is it's on the B2B side. It's another business. I think it's understanding, you know, how does their brand story and their their fit in with, um, you know, the customers they want to target, you know, which are there certain retailers that maybe understand that better and align with their story better and have a more aesthetically pleasing retail environment if they're on that higher end um, type or are they just going for mass market adoption and want to get in every store and be that bottom shelf um, tier pricing? So I think, you know, again, it comes back to knowing your business and knowing your strategy and and marketing accordingly. So you kind of like with the growers, you're more like thinking, all right, we're going to either be top shelf or bottom shelf right away. I mean, you just got to walk in knowing what you want to expect. Yeah. Well, and some of them will also sell their trim or their flower to infuse products companies. Mm. So maybe they're not, maybe their end goal is not to get their flower to the shelf so that I can walk in and buy it, but it's to get it to an edibles manufacturer who, you know, is all over the state and is doing really well and is well loved. And they can say they're the cultivator of that manufacturer. So yeah, they have a few different angles they can take. That's pretty cool. Is there any uh, media forms that you suggest people not to use? Um, not to use. 
I mean, I've seen, yeah, I mean, I've seen people use digital and use advertising on social media. And it's one of those things where people are running Facebook ads and I've seen it and they'll sometimes be up for a little bit and then Facebook will will almost catch it and take it down. Um, and so for some, that's a risk to take. And for others, not so much because, you know, it's possible Facebook can, you know, do what they do do with their be that could negatively impact how your brand is then organically seen where it's sort of up in the air how that actually happens but i've i've seen that happen to brands for sure yeah. um uh yeah so in terms of not i think it really is just more about who would you rather work with who you know what's the most appropriate channel as opposed to um what's inappropriate i think it's more what's effective for you versus what might just be a a loss or just not really resonate or hit as a, uh, a woman in cannabis, now I got a question for you, uh, especially in marketing. What are your thoughts on, as we like to call him, Dan Midzerian? I think that cannabis has historically faced an issue with being what I would say is quite lazy in their marketing. Um, I think hypersexualizing women is a really at its best, a lazy way to do your marketing. It means you're yeah. not being thoughtful about who you are or your brand or what you stand for because you think that the adage that sex sells is just gonna give you a business. Um, and I think that the cannabis industry could um, benefit from really having those conversations with themselves because you're also alienating and largely in half of the population by doing that. Um, I know very few women that respond positively to that type of information. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are better ways to market cannabis. Yeah. It's um, like an 80s beer fantastic. commercial. Yeah. The guy's gross. It's like an 80s beer commercial, you know, it's yeah. just chicken and bikini and Spuds McKenzie. And then you're partying on a, on a beach with a beer. And like you said, yeah. a cheap way out. It's a cheap, easy. <clears throat> it, yeah. It's a cheap way out. And I think it, um, is also a really just bad long-term strategy. Um, I think something that brands cannabis and beyond are really struggling with these days is just inauthenticity. And I think consumers, um, you know, like we need to give consumers more credit. They know when they're being marketed to in a way that is sleazy or lazy and it feels inauthentic. And when I see ads like that, I'm like, let me make a mental note to not purchase from this brand. And it might even be I was indifferent before and then I saw an ad like that and I'm now consciously going to avoid making that decision and will express that opinion at the point of sale at retail. Um, so I think that... Um, it's really important to think about your values and your ethos and who not only do you want to target from this is my customer, who are you alienating and why? And I also think it's, it's like, it's 2020. Like, what are we, why are we still doing this? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, like you can't think of anything else. Um, so. Well, Tom and I, we said before, it, the, the, the cannabis itself speaks for itself, the quality of whatever you're smoking. you know, I, I'm always a big fan when it comes to farmers and and smugglers you know I, I don't care about storefronts most part but the guy who brought me the weed and even still like the i was in a grow a couple months ago um and it's really nice weed uh but when you ask about the secret sauce like what do you do for dirt what do you do for uh, uh you know you get a little bit of information but they're, they're still afraid they're, they're still holding on to that knowledge because uh i mean there's still more uh uh Things that affect the cannabis plant growing uh, besides just the soil you know it's 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 temperature it's environment uh, uh circulation there's all these different things involved with growing cannabis and, and and the fact is if you have shitty cannabis there's what's the point of uh, uh of putting an ad out anyways like you know what's the point as, as, that's my opinion though well that's that is the point if you have shitty cannabis you have to market it even harder yeah. than that shit yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it doesn't and Oh. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I also think like it's sort of funny when I speak with growers because I have yet to meet a grower that has not grown the best weed there ever was. And they so all, they all do. They all do. Yeah. I speak tells me that, you know? And I'm like, well, why or how? I'm sure. And I'm more than happy and willing to try your product. But like, what makes it different? And I think, um, 
I, to your point, Maggie, about the cannabis industry sort of being historically a little bit more fearful um, is definitely still felt. And I think that's one of those ways in which it's still felt in terms of sharing information at that level. But there is, I think it's important to do because there is a really big gap between the general public and the cannabis industry in terms of knowledge. And I read a statistic somewhere. I I could be wrong on this, but it was like 60% of people don't know the difference between THC and CBD in the general public, or in, in that they're even cannabinoids, let alone what a cannabinoid is. So when you take it even that step back and say, you know, oh, tell me how the pH of your soil or whether it's hydro or not makes a difference in this experience is a really high level of education for the consumer to have for that to even make sense and register that I don't think the public is there yet. No. Um, but I think that needs to happen and is going to happen. But it's important for professionals in the space to be willing to edu educate, educational, so that we as consumers can have more informed conversations at the point of sale. Because exactly. I would love to ask, and I do, I ask very specific questions because I know, but whenever I take my friends who are not in the industry or new to cannabis, they're like, we don't know what you just, what just happened. Like, we don't know what you just said. We don't know how you just bought that. Like, do we have weed yet? Yeah. yeah. We have weed. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so there's a, there's a knowledge gap. Yeah. Um, and that's important to recognize. Well, I was thinking about today because uh, we're going to talk um, just like a home grow. I can anybody who, who home brews can make an IPA or a, uh, a, a dark beer or whatever. You know, I want to be able to grow an indica or a sativa, you know, but I have to learn through experience the hard way of actually doing it. Opposed to reading a book. If someone really just I mean, they're out there. But if the grow that I like, the, the that would be it right there, because that's your reference. Right. Let's just say um, uh, Willie's Reserve. I really like their, you know name so now I've, I've i'm using a cannabis i really like the cannabis now i want to know more about how the steak is made uh, and then you start digging into it but until we're at that point like you said i mean we're gonna get there but people we just gotta are. be not afraid to just say here's our secret sauce because nobody can duplicate someone's really good grow because it's about the space location and everything else besides the 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 food yeah, I've always said that, you know, the Kentucky Fried Chicken secret herbs and spices recipe, that doesn't matter. You can tell me that to the letter, give me every single measurement ingredient. I'll be like, I'll be right back and go try to cook it in my own kitchen. I will screw that shit right up. And so I, I realized that they want to play that kind of close to the chess game because I think it's a leftover of the um, the industry being illegal for so long, as opposed to like, here, let me show you how I brew this beer. There's more of a, a, a congeniality and like, you know, the, the people are sharing knowledge in those types of industries. But I think that's common. And, you know, and I really want to, I'm sorry to wrap this up or start to, but I got a call at three o'clock. So Lisa, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you? So the cannabis marketing association.com or mm -hmm. at cannabis marketing on Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. And you know, uh, one of the things we started the show with is where we can end it. Remember how we were asking about, you know, what is a lid anyway? I actually, I heard you guys talking about that. Yeah. My guess, and this is not, this is my best educated guess. It is. I'm not sure if this is the answer, um, but to me, it would be an eighth. All right. So uh, according to Facebook user in the 60s and 70s, the common coffee can had a lid like sardine can or a re rectangular. They used the lid as approximate uh, as, a, as a gauge for about four fingers of pot, which was approximately an ounce or a lid. So uh, thank wow. you, Facebook user. It's so obvious totally. which one it was. And Miggy, you were kind of right. You know, it's it was a lid. Yeah. Well, cool. I, I knew figures were evolved, too, but I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad that you did. But anyway, I again, thank you so much. And please go check her out over at the Cannabis Marketing Association dot com. You're going to have a whole bunch more people that need to service now in Michigan in a few days and then in Illinois in a month. See you True. guys next week. True.